Yes, we will finish Gospel of John tonight. But let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our prayer tonight is Psalm 138. I thank you, Lord, with all my heart. In the presence of the angels, to you I sing. I bow low towards your holy temple. I praise your name for your mercy and faithfulness. For you have exalted over all your name and your promise. On the day I cried out, you answered. You strengthened my spirit. All the kings of the earth will praise you, Lord, while when they hear the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord, how great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord is on high, but cares for the lowly, and knows the proud from afar. Though I walk in the midst of dangers, you guard my life when my enemies rage. You stretch out your hand, your right hand saves me. The Lord is with me to the end. Lord, have, Lord, your mercy endures forever. Never forsake the work of your hands. Almighty God, we thank you for this opportunity to study the Gospel of John as we conclude tonight. Help us to open our hearts and minds to the message of this Gospel that you are with us always until the end of the ages. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So we have one chapter left, but I want to go back to chapter 20 because I did, uh, I realized I did not touch on a couple of things. So I want to make sure that I do. So all the resurrection narrative, when you look at them, so just to remind you how it started, chapter chapter 20, it begin, begins with this, on the first day, your translation will have on the first day. The Greek literal will have on the day one of the week. Why? Because it refers us to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. On the day one of the week, God, cre God creates the, the heaven and the earth. So that's why they use the same uh, expression as the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible we have, the official Greek translation, the Septuagint. So on the day one of the week, why? This is the new creation. So we see Mary who goes into the tomb and she did not go in and then we have the disciples coming in and we see, just to remind you, we see Peter and the disciples whom Jesus loved running to the tomb. And I made fun of you last time because uh, you said, why did, why did these beloved disciples got first to the tomb? No, it wasn't because she was younger, okay? because she was in love. That's, that was the thing. That he was loving, that's why he was running faster. But then before he goes into the tomb, he does not enter the tomb. There are two explanations. One will be, some scholars will say that he has some connection or maybe is a priest from the temple. He's a Levite or, or priest. Why? Because he knows the high priest. That's why he's able to get Peter to the cult of high priest. So he might be someone, you know, if you are in Jerusalem, which is you know, 35,000 people, population, uh, you know, high priest will not, let's say, socialize with you uh, if you are a common folk. They will not just, you know, they are high class and so on. The only people that they would socialize with will, will be the priests, the Levites, or the people with a lot of money. That's, that's the way it is, right? So, uh, this beloved disciples was either someone who was loaded or someone who was a priest. That's what the scholar would say. That's why he would not enter the tomb where the body was laid. Why? Because then he would become impure. So that's one of the reasons. He didn't want to become, become impure, religiously impure. Because remember, the priests and Levites that perform their duties in the temple, they cannot have any contact with dead bodies. They cannot touch them. They cannot enter the graves, the tombs, nothing. They are a special class of uh, Levites for that. But the priests and the Levites who serve in the temple, they are not allowed to touch or be in contact with the tomb with the tomb or with the dead body okay so that might be one reason the other reason could be and again this is john so it's always at least a couple of uh, reasons for john writing something it's because as much as he is the believer and the beloved he does not let's say he does respect the authority that's why he waits for peter who is the first of the 12 who is the authority he waits for peter to arrive and enter the tomb first so you have two things going on at the same time. Which one is truth? Yes. <laughs> it's John, so it has to be both. Maybe there is another possibility. 
But what is the difference? Peter saw, but beloved disciples saw and believed. That's the difference. Why? Because he will be contrasted later on with Thomas. When we see chapter 24 in Thomas, Thomas, in verse 24, what's happening there? Thomas said, unless, not only I see, unless I put my finger into his wounds, I will not believe. So what Jesus says to him, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. So you see, contrast between beloved disciples and the twelve. I told you before, John, the author of this gospel, does not like the twelve. He always portrays them in a very, uh, let's say, less favorable light than way than, than others. So what is what is so that will be the contrast, and then we have this whole idea about Mary. Verse 11, just to go to that. And Mary was stand, standing outside of the tomb, okay, and she saw those two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. And I told you, this is basically the Ark of the Covenant. Because the Ark of the Covenant has two cherubs on the head and, on the, and, on the, and the, uh, where the feet are. So this is new Ark of the Covenant is the slab on which Jesus was put uh, laying after his death. And then this whole dialogue with, between Mary and John. Let me just read this one and I'm going to read you from the Song of Songs just to show you something. So saying this, verse 14, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, to your Father, to my God and you God. And let me, let me read you from Song of Songs, Song of Solomon. It's chapter 3, and this is the beloved uh, love, looking for her loved ones. Verse 3, the watchmen found me as they made their round in the city. Him whom my soul loves, have you seen him? Hardly had I left them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him to my mother's house, to the chamber of her who conceived me. See, this is basically, John is using this scene to show, in Song of Songs, in a very erotic language, the relationship between God and people of Israel is being described and expressed. So you have to remember, when you read Song of Songs, it's a highly erotic language. But it describes, and it was always in the Bible, it describes basically the relationship between God and his people, and, his, and, and people of Israel and God. Because they are the ones who seek the Lord. They are the ones who seek God. So Mary, in a way here, she's representing the new people of Israel. Well, that's why she's, she's trying to cling to Jesus, who is telling her, our relationship has changed. We're no longer master and disciples. We are, she says, brethren. That's why Jesus is saying, he's saying, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Because from this moment on, as I told you last time, we are all children of God. We are all brothers and sisters of Jesus, in a way. That's what he is, what, that's what he's telling us. So it's a relationship changes. That's why we cannot cling to that old relationship of master and disciple. It's more about loving relationship between uh, brothers and sisters and loving parent, loving God. Father, why did he say, why not I have ascended to my father? Where did that come into that? Well, this is all I did. This is a good question. Why he's talking about not ascending? Because he's still there. You know, ascension, which means he, Jesus has to do what you call secure uh, attachment. He has to teach his disciples how to be, let's say, be securely attached, what, was, what it means. Uh, meaning they have to grow up and go on without him. Okay, secure attachment and insecure attachment is basically a relationship between parents and children. You have those, you know, parents who never let go of their children, and children who will never leave their parents because it's always safe. They will live, you know, at home till they're 40, never married. Uh, if they married, then they will be a mess because they will, everything will be resolved in parents' home, and mother or father will be always enmeshed 
in, in children's life and always, you know, this, this very insecure enabling. That's insecure attachment. Secure attachment is, I did my job, you go on your own now. So that's basically what he's saying. He said, <coughs> Jesus needs to leave the disciples, first of all, to allow them to grow up, but also to have the Holy Spirit, the advocate, come to them. Yes, Juan? Um, it says, I mean, at least in, in, in the version of my Bible, it says, stop clinging to me. So it's the same, it's the same idea. Yeah. Song of Songs. That's, that's exactly where it comes from. Again, clinging. It's like, I don't want to let you go. I want to be because that felt safe, that relationship felt safe, and that's what I want. I don't want change. That's what we all dread, you know, change. Especially in the relationship status, right? When things are changing and so on, that we don't like that. We are afraid. But he said, as, as I have not ascended to my father. And you, father. Because he's teaching them right now. But there is no longer just his father. Jesus is not, only, is not the only son. He's the, the only begotten son. But now there are other children of God. They becoming the children. So the whole ascending is, I'm leaving you because I'm going to our father, our God. Okay? But he's basically telling them, I need to leave you. That's a, as simple as it is. You know, you let this, you drive your child to college, you let her or him at, in the dorm, you go back, you cry, but you don't call every 10 minutes or you don't call, come to visit them every, every, every day okay so that's what it is they need to grow up so the disciples need to grow up and the 12 do need to grow up so we, we see this that whole idea again the change of the relationship that's what is so important from discipleship to sonship from disciples to children of God I think that that's very important for, for us because that's what when, when you hear Church's prayer at Mass during Easter time especially. Everything is about sons and daughters, sons and daughters, children and all that. And so pay attention to the prayers that priest prays at the beginning of Mass or at the end of Mass and in between because there is a lot of this language of sonship, of uh, being children of God. And then we have this whole idea about shalom, 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 shalom. One more thing, okay, here is just to stress that one. Verse 21. So when Jesus said to them again, Shalom Alechem, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even I, so I send you. And the word I told you that before was apostoloi. So only from this moment on in Gospel of John, the twelve becomes become the apostles. Before everybody was a disciple. Now they are becoming apostles. Why? Because they are being sent. So he changes his language here. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So this whole idea about breathing on them, and I told you that, I think I did mention that. It's the, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God created man out of the dust and breathed into his spirit into him. And also Ezekiel, chapter 37, when God is telling to Ezekiel, prophesy, breathe, and the Spirit of God came upon the dry bones, and they were, being br they were brought to life. So this whole idea about new creation, but also bringing the dead back to life. So that's what this thing. So who is the Holy Spirit? Well, Holy Spirit is the breath of God. It's that love that God sends us, that God gives us to, that brings us back from death and also creates a new. And what is interesting about the power of the Holy Spirit, it's all about forgiveness of sins. If you forgive, you receive. And this is also reference to <coughs> the, the disciples this moment on, when they are being sent to, uh, to evangelize, they also receive the power of a rabbi. Because in, in Israel, and ancient Israel, and also even today, the rabbis are the ones who have power to bound and lose. Who have the power of no, forgive, not forgive sins, but leave people to forgive their sins. They said, your sins are being, being loosed. You know, you now God has forgiven you your sins. Your sins are being loosed or bidden. So they have power of bind and loose in relationships, in faith, and so on. So disciples now receive that power. And then we have Thomas. Again, we look through that. Just to remind you this, if your translation is place my finger, in the mark of his nails, the balay in the word in Greek is to pierce, is to put it in. So it's very, it's very strong. 
So Thomas just doesn't, doesn't want to touch the, the, the wounds. He wants to put his finger in, just to make sure that they are real. <laughs> you know? But then also he, Thomas proclaims, my Lord and my God is the first profession, first profession of the divinity uh, in, in this gospel. This is so powerful. And verse 30, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. So John is writing this very clearly. I pick up those seven signs because I wanted to just talk about those seven signs. The rest of them are not on my, I have no interest in the rest of them. That's why when you look at other gospels and all that, uh, you cannot combine John and other gospels. Because John picked up his signs for a reason and there's a reason to prove, let's say, yeah, to prove his agenda, because he does have an agenda, <laughs> okay, in a good sense. So, chapter 21. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, of Sea of Galilee, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Did you count how many of them were there? Yeah? Seven. <laughs> it has to be twelve or seven. So there is seven of them. Why? Seven is the perfect number. Why not twelve? Because it's only eleven of them right now. Okay? So it, it has to be seven because it cannot be twelve. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. That, that sounds familiar to you. When they go and try to catch something and they don't catch anything. You heard that in other Gospels. But in other Gospels, you hear this catch of fish at the beginning of those Gospels. Because the, this uh, catch that, you know, where they don't catch any fish and Jesus tells them where to, where to put the nets and then they catch a lot of fish. It's in all the other Gospels in the Synoptics. It's at the beginning of the Gospels when Jesus is calling his disciples. That's how they're being called. Because they left their nets and they follow him after this miraculous catch. In this gospel, this miracle, of actually this miraculous catch of fish, is after the resurrection. Why? Because as we were reading, you realize throughout the whole gospel, the twelve were totally clueless. They weren't called apostles, they were called disciples like everybody else. Only after the resurrection, when they encounter the risen Christ, they are being called apostles and they are being basically called to go and uh, to evangelize. Okay? So John kind of reverses the order. You know, w which one is true? Maybe both. You know, it's, we don't know, but certainly that something happens after the resurrection that they are being sent and they, everything changes in their lives, which before they were with Jesus and they were totally clueless. They had no clue what was going on. So just as they was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then why did not know? The resurrected body is different. It's the same, but different. Oh, by the way, there is one image that they, they want to, because not everybody pays attention to that. When priest holds the host, uh, let's say, at the consecration. At the consecration, what we do? The, the host is whole and priest raises up. This is my body, this is my blood. Okay? What happened right before communion? The host is broken. Why is body, broken body? Death, right? Then the priest puts the host together usually. And he raises up together. And he says, behold the Lamb of God, the servant of God, and so on. Is that the same piece of bread? Is it different? Okay, because it is broken and it's being put together. So this is the symbolism that we use with the host. Okay, I know a lot of you miss it because nobody ever told you probably about that. But this is symbolism that we use during Mass to remind us about the resurrection, about the body of Christ. This is the body that is the same but different. We only recognize that body as a body of Christ when he reveals himself to us. The same as in Gospel of John. They are not able to recognize him unless he calls them by name or, or sends them peace or eats with them. Only at that time they recognize him as the risen Lord, as, as Jesus. So there is something you see in this imagery that we use at Mass that refers us right to Gospel of John. 
So next time you see that working, you know why we do this. So Jesus said to them, Children, have you any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And you can go to Matthew chapter 5 and Mark, I think, that chapter 3, no, 2, and then you know, Luke. And you will see the same story at, at the beginning of the Gospels when they are being called. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in for the quantity of fish. Now, can you imagine? You work whole night. It's a back-breaking job. And then, you know, early in the morning, when it's just day is breaking in, okay? So there was, there was night, you catch nothing. Now it's day, and you're going to have this great catch. You see a stranger who is telling you, do this. And you're like, yeah. So either you have to have a lot of faith, or he has to have a lot of authority. And in this case, probably it was both. You know, because they, they, they changing. They slowly changing the disciples. They don't recognize him, but they do listen to even a stranger who is telling them. So he's telling them, cast the nets. So they cast it. Now they were not able to hold it for the quantity of fish. That disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So again, the one who loves, that we love the disciples, he recognized Jesus right away. Okay? Now, Peter, as always, Peter. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his clothes, for he was straight for work, and jumped into the sea. Now, who will do that? You, put, you take your clothes off before you jump into the water, right? <laughs> no, he was working only in his loincloth, but he puts everything on, jumps into the water, and imagine trying to swim or fully dressed like that. You know, the flowing robes and all that. So again, Peter, as you see, Peter is not being portrayed as a very bright, well, which is a hope. Because no matter what you think about Holy Father, either this one or before and so on, just look at this. They were from the beginning, they were like that. <laughs> Not the smartest one, very hard-headed, but they get the job done. As simple as it is. God picks up, God chooses not the qualified, God qualifies the chosen. So next time you complain about uh, Pope Francis doing something or saying something go back and read this passage <laughs> from John from the very beginning Father, yes I always thought if he got dressed it was kind of as a reverence gesture because he was going to the Lord he didn't want to be in his underdog but they were 100 yards from the shore took them like, you know, before Peter got swam into the shore, they already pulled in in boat to the shore. So he could stay in the boat. But Peter is so impulsive that he just doesn't think. He puts the clothes, jumps in. Like cuts the off, you know, the ear of the Malchus, you know, in the midst of the 400 people who are, you know, with, them, with him. So he's very impulsive. That's what he's showing here. Again, but the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from land about 100 yards off so you see he could just wait and you know, kind of help them to uh, let's say to get to the shore faster but no he has to do his own thing now when they got all the land they saw a charcoal fire with fish lying on it and bread okay charcoal fire if you look at this gospel, you've, we've seen that a couple of times before in this gospel. A charcoal fire. In chapter 18 especially, in connection with Peter. What was happening in chapter 18? When he denies Jesus, he was at the charcoal of fire twice. So, John brings us into the same scene that they will be at the fire of made of charcoal. Why? Because now Peter will have to reverse his betrayal. He, that will be the reverse. The healing will happen in the same way, in the same setting, basically. So th that's why he, he puts it that way. Fish and bread. Why fish and bread? Again, fish, because they were fishermen. And also you have to remember that uh, acronym, the fish ichthyos in Greek, is an acronym for Jesus of Nazareth, son of the living God. Ichthyos. Savior, and it ends up with Savior. Jesus of Nazareth, son, son of God, Savior. Iktos. So, fish, it's always standing for 
Christians, for Christianity. That's why when you go to catacombs in Rome, when you go to Israel, you see everywhere mosaics and drawing of fish. Why? Well, it was a code, code name. Okay, this is where we gather. This is where Christians gather. That's what they would use. That's why nowadays, you know, you see that uh, very often on car, uh, car bumper stickers, right? You have the fish and so on. Guess what the Muslims have as a car bumper sticker? A shark. <laughs> Guess why? Yeah. Shark eat fish. You will see, if you see shark on the bumper sticker on, on a car, you know it's a Muslim. I'm not making it up. Pay attention. <laughs> Well, because Jesus, remember, this is taking us up to this, back to the miraculous, uh, let's say, multiplication of love and fish. There was a little boy who has a little fish and everything else. Now Jesus is there and he has the fish and bread. He is the one who feeds the disciples. You know, he asks them if they have any fish, but he's the one who provides the breakfast. Okay? So again, you see, you see shark on the bumper sticker, you know what you're dealing with. On the bumper sticker, we're on the license. No, on the bu bumper stickers, they, they have that, you'll see that. Yeah. Here, not as much, but like, you know, like the, when I was living in Northeast, that was a lot of that. You know, wherever you have bigger Muslim population, you will have that. Yeah. So, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Okay, there was not enough fish, so he has to share. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. Who was counting? <laughs> Why hundred and fifty-three? There is a many, there is a many explanations. The most uh, plausible one is some of the Greek philosophers of Greek scientists in in, in, in ancient times, like Pliny not Socrates, a couple others of them. They believed that there were 153 kinds of fish in the world. So 150 means they catch all kinds of fish, all of them. Not only some, but all of them. That's why it's 153. <coughs> and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Again, tearing the net... If you remember what other, place, other places in a couple ch chapters before about tearing, about something that was being preserved, the Jesus tunic. So the net here, it's a symbol of the church. Church catching all kinds of fish. Not only some, but all of them. All possible kinds of fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. I love this part. They kind of like, yeah, is he not? But yeah, we know it's him, but he doesn't look the same, or he looks different, but the same. But they still knew he, he's, the, he, he's the, the resurrected Christ. You know, they just saw him uh, like a week before, a couple of weeks earlier, in the, you know, when, when the door were closed, right, during the Easter, and then a week after. So there was, there was this, let's say, strange thing going on here, that they know it's him, but they still doubt. And again, going back to Eucharist, isn't that exactly what we do during Eucharist? How often you just see that piece of bread? And you know it's Jesus, but all you see is that piece of bread. So it takes an act of faith to know that this is the Lord, that this is the body of Christ, not just piece of piece of bread. So this is, he plays with those images because the community is a very Eucharistically oriented community. And he wants them to realize that their doubts, that their misunderstanding sometimes, or not understanding fully what they do during the Eucharist, is exactly what disciples went through. They encounter resurrected Christ, they still it's kind of like, okay, it's, it's him or not him, we know it's him, but we still don't believe it's him. And it's like, it's a challenge, it's, it's, a, it's a constant challenge. <clears throat> so he wants the, his community to realize that that's part of our Christian life. That we will never be 100% sure unless we make a decision to trust, to believe. 
It's all about believing. So Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. Here we go. Back to this multiplication of loaves. He takes bread, he gives it to them. And so with the fish. When you look at uh, chapter 6, that multiplication of loaves, that exactly is verbatim. The same sentence is used. So this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, here we go now. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So pay attention to what's happening. Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me more than the other ones? Okay. Remember, love is a choice that you make. It's not emotion in a, in a scripture. It's very little emotion. Emotion has very little to do with love in a scripture. It's a choice that people that we make for the other. And Jesus is, this dialogue is interesting because they, John plays on two words in Greek. I told you that Greeks have four words to express love. Right? One is storge, which is, uh, I love my dog, I love, my, I, love, I love pink, and so on. That's storge. The other one is eros, which is, uh, let's say, love that is uh, fruitful love, that is erotic, erotic love. The next one is philio. Philio is like Philadelphia. The brotherly love, the love of equals. And the highest <coughs> level is agape, which is selfless giving, selfless total giving. So here Jesus is asking Peter, Peter, do you agape me? Which means, do you love me with that love that comes from above, that the love that more than anything else? What is Peter's response? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. Which means, I'm your buddy. He's asking, can you love me with a selfless love? I said, oh yeah, I'm your friend, I'm your buddy. Jesus asked second time, do you agape me? Peter responds, yes, Lord, I phileo you. The third time, Jesus is asking, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know everything, you know that I phileo you. So what's happening? Jesus goes back from that level of agape, because he knows Peter is not capable of agape love. And he goes down to his level and telling him, that's where we're going to be. And his, what will be the expression of that love, of that phileo? He says, what we, we can see that here, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. And then the last one, he says, feed my sheep. Remember, this is the gospel of good shepherd. The good shepherd is Jesus. From this moment on, who is the good shepherd? Peter, with all his shortcomings, misunderstandings, and impetuity and everything else. He's been uh, put in charge as a, as a sh good shepherd. Why he has, he has to be asked three times? Well, that's why he got sad, because he knows this is making up for triple denial. So at the same time, the healing is happening. You see, he knows that he messed up. And imagine how he, how he felt, you know, all that time when Jesus was telling him, peace be with you, you know, everything is fine, you're being sent. And all of a sudden, finally, they have to come to the point when Jesus is telling him, okay, you have to make up for what you did. And this making up for what you did is, you have to three times tell me that you do choose me over yourself and over all the others. That's why, do you love me, love, do you love me more than the others? Because you have, he have, Peter has to make choice for Jesus. And that's what, what is the most important part here. And it has to be done three times. Why? Because of the triple denial. So Jesus said to him, verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, Amen, Amen, I say to you, When you were young, you were fastened, you fastened your own belt, and walked where you would. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will fasten your belt and you, for you, and carry you where you do not wish to go. This he said to show by what death he was to glorify God. And after this, he said to him, Follow me. See, this is the original call of the apostles. In Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Jesus tells Peter, follow me at the beginning of the Gospel after the miraculous catch. Here, this follow me is only at the end, after the resurrection. After Peter makes up for his denials, so now he is worthy to be an apostle. <coughs> and again, stre stretching out his hands to indicate what death he was to glorify God. Remember, Peter was crucified, stretching out his hands. Okay, That's what, that's what happened. 
So that was that's what, what uh, he's uh, referring here to, that he would be crucified the same way Jesus was. Actually, they, t- they crucified him upside down. Which is, well, uh, what was that? Did you ever read the uh, novel uh, by Shusaku Endo, The Silence? They made movie out of it. Excellent, excellent mo- novel, excellent movie. It happens uh, during the persecution in 16th century persecution of Christians in Japan. And Japanese were uh, like Romans. They knew how to torture people you know, at that time. So what they did, they would crucify or hang people upside down. And if so- for some of them, they will cut little cuts behind their ears that the blood would drip slowly. But what happened when you hang someone upside down? Eventually, all the, you know, the, the heart cannot pump blood anymore and everything goes to the brain and brain just explodes. It's a very, they say, you know, it's a painful death, but uh, like anything else, you know, again. But this is a kind of tells you that this whole idea about to, to what length we will go to stop the good news, to stop the message. That people will invent torture, and well, no matter what, just to, you know, force people to either to denial or punish them for their faith. And we see that, again, Israel and uh, Hamas right now. You know, people being killed in a brutal way, burned alive, and whatever else was happened, only because they were Jew. Nothing else. There was no no other reason. Only because they were Jewish. So, some people didn't, uh, let's say, graduate from Middle Ages yet. Some people are still stuck in the barbarian times, you know. But that's, that's what it is. We're still capable of that, unfortunately. So I think that's something that we need to look at. The silence. Yeah, Shusaku Endo. It's a. You can find that movie. The movie came out like four years ago. It's very well made, excellent. So it's, it's worth seeing. Did you get that on Netflix? Excuse me. Netflix. Did you get that? <laughs> I know the Amazon Prime has it, and so Netflix should have it as well. Yeah. But I highly recommend if you have, you know, want to learn something about the history of Christianity and also maybe just look at your faith because it's also the, the case of two Jesuits who were forced, in a way, to deny their faith because they said, if you don't deny the faith, we're going to kill all, the, all you faith, all those Christians that are there. So for the sake of saving lives of others, they denied their own faith. One of them. The other one is, didn't. But the, the story is being told in such a way that is it's very powerful. Uh, Highly recommended. Not too many, not too much blood in that movie. They they were kind of okay with that, so they they didn't put too much gore in it. Verse 20. So Peter turned and saw following him the disciples whom Jesus loved, who had lain close to his breast at the supper and had said, "Lord, who is it that is going to betray you?" When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, "Lord, oh, what about this man?" Jesus said to him, "If it is my will that he remain until I come." What is that to you? Follow me. Okay. The saying spread abroad among the brethren that these disciples were not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So this whole idea, you can see that this gospel, this passage was written. You know, chapter 21 was added to the gospel a little later. Why? Because at the end of chapter 20, you have the, you have the ending of the gospel. Chapter 21 was added by the same author because language is the same, synaxis is the same, everything is the same. But he added it probably a couple of years after writing the gospel because the beloved disciple died. So the scandal of the community is <coughs> they thought that beloved disciples will be alive until the second coming. When he died, they scandalized. What we do? The same thing like Paul when he, when he writes to Corinthians. You know, some people died in the community, and they're like, okay, what's going to happen with them? You know, would the, those who are dead, would they be risen to, together with those who are alive when, on the second coming? This whole idea. What is uh, Jesus telling us here? Don't, be not preoccupied with things that you have no clue about. Follow me. That's what he says. Which means don't speculate about other things and so on. You just follow me. So that's what he says to Peter. And this is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things and who has written these things and we know that his testimony is true. So 
You see, the one who is writing the gospel is a disciple of the beloved disciple. That's probably what it is. That's why he writes this, this way. So, first hand accounts with everything else. But the whole, it's a, an idea about the community. He's very concerned about the community. Why? Because he says, verse 25, there, were, there are also many other things which Jesus did where were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So he ends up a little different than chapter 20 because chapter 20 ends up, you have believed because you have seen me, blessed are, no, sorry. But these things were written that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So now we know he wrote what he wrote because he wanted to write it that way. So we cannot ask ourselves why there are not certain characters in this gospel that they are in others, why he is using things differently, he puts the timing, time things differently. He has something to teach, he has a lesson to teach, and he did it very well. So it's a very good gospel. So just to kind of put it all together, symbolism this gospel, I would just stress that over and over again. Remember, seven signs. And seven signs, the most important one is the multiplication of laws. Why? Eucharist. Because there is no account of establishing Eucharist at the Last Supper. Also, other symbols. If there is a person in this Gospel, just to remind you, that has no name to it. Mother of Jesus, woman of Samaria, anything else that is not named. That person plays a symbolic role. They basically usually represent a group of people men born blind and all the other things so that's what it is when there are names the names are usually uh, let's say historical John actually it's funny because the scholars came up to this conclusion uh, studying all those gospels all this. John is probably much more historical than the synoptics he's much more accurate when it comes to history geography and uh, yeah and places when he describes places, there are places that, that were discovered that existed. Synoptics have this tendency to make up things a little bit more. But again, it's a story being told to teach us you know, what we're supposed to believe in, in. Questions about the gospel? Yes? Yes, it's, uh, you, you mentioned a, uh, a reading of Peter that is common, that he's a clumsy, impetuous, well, less perhaps at times. But at the end, he is the disciple that is chosen to be the shepherd. Yeah. How do you reconcile that duality? Very simple. Peter is human like each and every one of us. So the one who is chosen to lead the, the flock is like you and me. As simple as it is. He could probably be even more clumsy or worse. But the thing is, idea to realize that and again, John is very strong on that. He does not like authorities. He does not like people in power. That's why it's con constant struggle between Jewish authorities and Jewish power, Romans, and Jesus. Peter represents authority in the church. He doesn't like that, but he recognizes that authority is necessary because if you don't have it, it's a chaos. So sometimes he says, they're not perfect. They do their own thing. Yet to do listen to them. Okay, that's that's what it, because they were you know the, the authority was appointed the shepherd they received that power from Jesus so it's just it's just this touch on humanity of those who are in because remember once you have the, the, all that power you think you are invincible that you know everything that you're the best you start believing your press releases you know look what's happened uh, let's say you drink your own cool it. yeah you know, you know Trump was perfect example of that. Obama was a perfect example of that. Over almost every politician that gets there, like president, they think they got. They think they, they can do it all and they know it all. Okay? So that's that would be the the thing with the power. We need to know the human like you and me. So that's why what we need to uh, to realize. Uh, yes. Wasn't Peter the first one to recognize that Jesus was the Son of God? Not in this gospel. No, not in this, but in other. other gospels. Yes, they portrayed Peter as the one who pro who make the profession. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. Mm -hmm. But his idea of Messiah is very different than Jesus' idea of Messiah. 
So even if he professes what he professes, he still has no clue what he is t- talking about. Because for him, Messiah is someone who will be a big general, king, someone who will deliver Israel. That's what for, what for Peter is. At the beginning, you know, after the resurrection and uh, ascension, things change a little bit. It's a tough portrayal. It is. You know, I said you have to realize there is there is there is, a, there is no much love between the writer of this gospel and the twelve. Because he recognized them as, you know, they were with, imagine, someone who is a really, real believer, someone who is on fire with faith. He sees those two, pe- those 12 people. He said, they were with Jesus for two years. And they ran away. Exactly. Peter was, you know, a special one. And they deny him three times. You know, they're useless. There's no respect for those people. Yet those are the people that Jesus chose. And those he, are the disciples. And, that, and that's what he sh- on Peter that the church was yeah. founded. And so that's, there is a tension between... Yeah intrinsic value and virtue of Peter and a you know a slapstick reading of Peter yeah absolutely but this whole idea is here that's for, for us to realize the authorities in the church are lousy we are all messing up but it's they are necessary in order for church to function unfortunately right in Maybe none of the four gospels do any of the disciples refer to the love of, of Jesus as agape the only thing that they do is it's philo and that's basically it but agape doesn't appear in that context ever so that 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 aspect of, of, of agape and then philo and philo that's exactly right and that's the way it, it reads but but that's not unique to Peter that's the well, the four gospels yeah this is the same word actually other gospels use the words agape and so on but this whole no, idea here is do, but, but agape does have that meaning I mean I read it in the Greek directly mm-hmm. agape does have that meaning and it, it has, it's a different meaning but the agape is not a feeling that the human being can generate by himself or herself exactly it's a, it's a, it's a love that's only possible through a divine relationship it's that's why, than human. that's why in this gospel you have the disciples whom Jesus loved who is the one who believes who knows see that's what it is so it's not about our, let's say, expressing agape towards God. It's God loving us exactly. and us responding to that. Yeah, my only point is that the philo, philo, the agape philo, philo line, yeah. which is, you know, has spawned libraries of, of yeah, we lines, get is not unique to people. Put it that way, we are not able of agape. Exactly. Not capable as, hum- as human that's beings the without the grace of God. Exactly. Okay? Because that's why we have those you know, we have in our history martyrs, people who gave their lives for others, people who did extraordinary things, but they were, those were the people who responded to the love of God. It wasn't their initiative, it's more, uh, the only initiative that they have, they made choice for it, to respond. Okay? You want to have to award. It will, it will there will be no awards. Yeah. People will be fighting with each other. Well, I find it. <laughs> in the resurrected body. <laughs> in the resurrected body, we won't have those problems. Any other questions? All right, so we have concluded the Gospel of John.